Welcome to tonight. I'm glad to see all the faces out there. I'm Lynn Erdman. For those of you I've not had the pleasure to meet, I'm the executive director here at Carolina Breast Friends. And we are thrilled to have Dr. Misra back with us again by popular demand. She's a medical oncologist at Novant Health Cancer Institute here in Charlotte. And she specializes in breast cancer, as many of you know, because I know some of you are her patients. She will be discussing the use of her septum and its effect in the heart, and also in her two positive breast cancer. In other words, what is the effect that her septum has? So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Misra and let her do the excellent presentation that I know she's put together. So thank you for being with us, Dr. Misra. And we'll say, do you, you can explain if you would like to have questions while you're talking or at the end, and we can handle it either way. Um. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining me this evening. Um, I um, have always appreciated um, being involved in the um, Carolina Breast Friends and speaking at the Pink House. Um, and I have been, um, I've always enjoyed just speaking with our um, patients and going through, um, through some of these challenging discussions. Um, I will say that I am um, missing the pink house and sitting on those uh, couches and being able to just get to know um, all of the people involved in the pink house. And I'm looking forward to one day returning there and having that nice um, warm environment where everyone feels comfortable to ask questions. And so, yes, I would very much want this environment, even though we're in the Zoom world, to be as similar as possible. So if patients have any questions or if I'm moving too fast through these topics, please uh, feel free to stop me and ask any questions as we're going through. This is going to be a very relaxed uh, presentation. So, um, so the title of my discussion is Her to New Directed Therapy and the cardiotoxicity risks associated with Herceptin. Um, and I am a breast medical oncologist. I am also the co-director of the cardio-oncology program at the Novant Health Wizager Institute. Um, so first off, I know everyone is coming from different backgrounds in breast cancer. And so I think it's very important to understand why Herceptin has made so many changes in breast cancer care. You know, back in the 1960s, the primary mode of therapy for breast cancer was chemotherapy. And um, chemotherapy works on, on um, hurting or killing breast cancer cells that are, that are cells that are actively dividing. But at the same time, it doesn't only target breast cancer cells. So we're also seeing that the cells that are actively dividing are also being harmed by chemotherapy. And so when patients receive chemotherapy, that's why they have side effects of losing their hair, having mouth sores, having GI toxicities with nausea, diarrhea, and it can affect your um, bone marrow and make you more prone to infections. So chemotherapy carries so many broad side effects. And so the reason that Herceptin and um, other targeted therapies have been so miraculous over the past two decades in breast cancer is because it is specifically targeting a breast cancer cell without affecting a lot of our normal cells. So scientists have figured out specific differences in the cancer cells compared to the normal cells and this information is used to create a target. The one that we most often hear about in breast cancer is the estrogen receptor. That is an easy target for a lot of our breast cancer patients. Almost 60% of our patients are estrogen receptor positive, and that's why anti-estrogen therapy is so effective. HER2 new really uh, was discovered in the late, 19, uh, late 1990s, and it wasn't until early 2000s that we actually had Herceptin um, for use uh, initially for our stage four breast cancer patients and then our earlier stage breast cancer patients. And that's, uh, you know, I remember hearing the initial presentations. I was not practicing oncology at that time, but I remember um, a lot of my 
attendings when I was in training describing how miraculous that first presentation was when they discovered Herceptin and the responses that we were seeing um, in this uh, aggressive breast cancer. So again, just to review a little bit, breast cancer over the past 20 years, we are realizing is not just one disease. There are many different subtypes. So this is a heat map of all the different types of uh, genes that we can see in breast cancer. And with this heat map, we've created sort of categories of breast tumor subtypes. And at this point, there are pretty much four big categories of breast cancer. There is the estrogen receptor positive HER2 new negative breast cancers. There's the estrogen receptor positive HER2 new positive breast cancers estrogen receptor negative HER2 new positive breast cancers, and then the estrogen receptor negative HER2 new negative, the one that we also call triple negative. And I would say that probably over the next, next decade or subsequent decades, we are going to identify even additional subtypes and even more targeted therapy. And that would be our hope as we get better and better at treating breast cancer. So just to simplify things, like I said, there are four subtypes that we really target in uh, breast cancer. It's our estrogen receptor positive HER2 new negative and our triple negative are two separate subtypes. But today we're gonna be primarily talking about the HER2 new positive breast cancers, which are about 20 to 25% of our breast cancer patients. And this is typically characterized as having a more aggressive growth pattern, typically, HER2 new positive expression means that a patient does require chemotherapy and HER2 new targeted therapy. And the chemotherapy is primarily tailored based on the size of the tumor and uh, response to initial therapy. So what is the HER2 new receptor and what is Herceptin trastuzumab? And unfortunately with all drugs, there are two names to every drug. So with Herceptin, the other name for that drug is trastuzumab. So HER2 new is a growth factor receptor on cancer cells. So it is sitting on the outside of cancer cells. It is encoded by a gene called ERB2 and it's located on chromosome 17. And activation of that growth factor receptor leads to tumor growth. Um, Herceptin is a antibody that binds to that receptor. And by binding to that receptor, it stops that internal mechanism of growth or signaling cascade that would cause growth, but it also activates our own immune system to fight that cancer cell. So we've all been hearing about antibodies with the COVID infection and whether you've developed antibodies to an infection or to a vaccine. So our bodies make antibodies to infections but our body doesn't know how to make antibodies to cancer. So that's what's so amazing about Herceptin. It was developed in a laboratory, and now we can actually infuse that antibody into our bodies, um, and that triggers the immune system to recognize a cancer cell as foreign and destroy it. And at this point, Herceptin or trastuzumab is used in all stages of disease. So this is a slide sort of showing the mechanism of action of different HER2 new directed therapies. And I will start with Herceptin or trastuzumab because that was the really the first drug that we know of that targets the HER2 new receptor. And so um, in this diagram, you can see the HER2 new receptor and it is on the outside of a cell of a breast cancer cell. And the trastuzumab is the actual antibody. This is the antibody that binds to that receptor. And by binding to that receptor, it stops this internal signaling cascade that would have caused the cancer cell to proliferate and grow. And it also activates your own immune system to, uh, to attack the cell, identifies it as foreign or an infection and destroys the cell. So as I mentioned, it is the first antibody that was developed to target the HER2 new receptor, and it's been effective in about 20 to 25% of our patients with breast cancer. Um, and 
Like I said, it's activating the immune system to destroy the breast cancer cell and also disrupts intracellular signaling. So over the past 10 years, we have further advanced from trastuzumab and one of the drugs that most patients with early stage breast cancer may have also heard is pertuzumab. And so this, this drug works in combination with trastuzumab and it hits a different part of the HER2 new receptor. So this is that HER2 new receptor that Herceptin binds. And what it also binds to is HER1, HER3, and HER4. And what it does is it help, it prevents what we call dimerization of these two antibodies. So it creates a more affecting blocking mechanism of the HER2 new receptor. So by com combining trastuzumab and pertuzumab, we are more effectively activating the immune system to fight the cancer, blocking signaling pathways for HER2 new receptor downstream. Um, and it has, and this has shown um, improvements in long-term survival um, and cure rates um, with the addition of pertuzumab to Herceptin. And then finally, the next step beyond Herceptin and pertuzumab has been TDM1. Um, and TDM1 is a even more effective antibody in that it's not only just an antibody that activates the immune system and stops intracellular signaling, it is bound to chemotherapy. So this becomes a little bit even more fancy in that the antibody TDM1 binds to HER2 new, and then it is taken up intracellularly and sneakily, it comes into what we call the lysosomes. If you remember your biology, breaks up that TDM1 and then releases chemotherapy within the cell itself. And so that is how it is even more effective in eliminating uh, breast cancer cells. Um, and so, like I mentioned, pertuzumab Herceptin is the combination that we typically see and use in our stage two to stage four breast cancer patients. Pertuzumab does not work well on its own. It has to be used with Herceptin and it's typically combined with some chemotherapy backbone to, um, to accentuate its effects. Um, and then this, this um, slide shows more of just the TDM1. Um, and like I said, it is TDM1 is an antibody drug conjugate. So it's the next level beyond Herceptin and pertuzumab where it is internalized and the chemotherapy is actually then targeted to just those cells that are HER2 new overexpressed. So I think when we are talking about Herceptin, I think it's un important for everyone to understand that with HER2 new positive breast cancers, primarily we are treating our patients with what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So neoadjuvant means that we are giving Herceptin upfront um, before patients go to surgery. Um, and the reason that we are giving HER2 new directed therapy up front primarily is because we know that the response rate to HER2 new directed therapy actually predicts and help, uh, helps us understand how well the chemotherapy works, helps us understand how, um, what, how, what is the likelihood of cure with these chemotherapy treatments. So we prefer when we see patients with stage two to stage three breast cancer, we prefer to give these drugs up front. Um, and so, like I said, the primary reason is for prognostic purposes to see how well the drug works, but it has also been helpful to facilitate surgery. So sometimes if a woman has a large breast mass and they don't want to have to go through a full mastectomy, by giving chemotherapy up front, we can actually shrink the tumor size and potentially allow for breast conservation. It also can help spare a woman from going through as much axillary surgery where we take out all the lymph nodes. If we can clear a lot of the disease with these targeted th therapies with Herceptin and pertuzumab, we can actually spare a woman a more um, aggressive surgery 
which also carries long-term side effects. So, um, so, so like I said, we typically give- uh -uh, Get out of here. Sorry, is there a question? Okay. So like I said, if we, um, we, we typically like to give for our stage two to stage three breast cancers, neoadjuvant treatment with pertuzumab and Herceptin. And so what we do is we give pertuzumab, Herceptin along with a chemotherapy backbone. And then we take women to surgery. And then we look at that final pathology and see if the cancer is all gone. If the cancer is all gone, then we continue pertuzumab Herceptin alone. However, if there is evidence of residual disease, then we try to offer other treatments. And that's when we go to our more fancy drug, the TDM1 that I described. Um, the other name for it is Kedsyla. Now, we are starting to recognize that not all women need so much therapy, um, such aggressive therapies, particularly our stage one breast cancer patients have been shown to have an excellent prognosis. And for that reason, they don't need as much chemotherapy. And we're starting to move towards giving a simpler regimen of um, a, a, a lighter chemotherapy called paclitaxel, which we give weekly plus Herceptin. Um, sometimes in this group, we may even consider a drug called TDM1 for a full year. And both of these regimens are a lot lighter, a lot easier for our stage one. Um, and then I will put in a plug that we um, currently at Novant have the COMPASS trial, which is actually recognizing that our patients who are getting HER2 new directed therapy are having very high response rates. And perhaps we don't need as much chemotherapy um, as we initially thought. So we are starting to look at whether we could give less chemotherapy to our stage two to stage three breast cancer patients. Um, and so this is something that it could be, um, could change our management in the future based on this trial. Um, in this trial, we're looking to see if we could maybe spare them from receiving the carboplatin backbone of, um, of our chemotherapies. So typically our treatment regimens in the neoadjuvant setting are TCHP or docetaxel, carboplatin, herceptin, pertuzumab, or a anthracycline-based regimen of doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, paclitaxel, herceptin, and pertuzumab. I would say for the most part, we're typically giving docetaxel, carboplatin, herceptin, pertuzumab, the first regimen. And it's pretty rare that we incorporate adriamycin, particularly because we are all sensitive about the cardiotoxicity risks, which is um, the other part of this talk. And then, like I said, we will consider TDM1 based on the response from neoadjuvant therapy. We are starting to also incorporate another drug called neratinib, which is an oral um, inhibitor of HER2 new um, uh, breast cancers. And so the way that this works, it doesn't target the the outside part of the HER2 receptor, but in fact affects the intracellular signaling pathway um, and has been particularly shown to have benefit in those patients who have a large volume of disease, do not have a great response to upfront chemotherapy and are estrogen receptor positive. Um, and that is a um, pill that we offer patients for up to a year. And then just to show how much we've advanced um, with HER2 new directed therapies over the past 20 years um, in more of our advanced breast cancer patients with stage four, we now have multiple lines and multiple ways to target HER2 new therapy, HER2 new with inher 2 to catnib, lapatinib, and margituximab. And with this strategy of different drugs, we have uh, been able to successfully um, have patients live longer with stage four disease and be able to have better quality of life because of these targeted therapies, patients are noticing less side effects and toxicities. So let me go on to the cardiotoxicity concerns. And I think, you know, in the first part of this talk, I think what I would take away is that what we've really seen with Herceptin is that by being a targeted therapy, we have seen 
increased efficacy with less toxicity. Um, but one of the toxicities that I think most patients and clinicians are worried about is the effect of, of it on the heart. I think what's reassuring is that when you look at all of these trials, the incidence of heart problems is low. Um, so this is quoting a, a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is where you take multiple trials that have been looked at in HER2 new positive breast cancers that are among patients receiving trastuzumab. And so in this trial, they had almost 12,000 women and they combined all these trials. And ultimately they came up with that the trastuzumab had about a 2.5% increased risk of heart failure compared to 0.4% um, among those who did not receive trastuzumab. So this risk is definitely there, but it's small. Um, and so, and then one of our sort of our most meaningful and most impactful trial for her to new therapy in the early stage patients was the NSABP B31 trial, where patients, where about 2,000 patients with lymph node positive HER2 new positive breast cancer were treated with either chemotherapy alone or Herceptin and chemotherapy. And in that trial, only 4% of the patients actually had a decline in cardiac function. Mind you, um, many of those patients were asymptomatic. Um, and some, um, and only 1.3% of the patients who did not receive Perceptin also had cardiomyopathy. So the difference is small, um, but there is noted difference of decline in cardiac function. Out of this whole trial, only one patient died of heart failure. And majority of the patients in this trial recovered fully without any long-term heart failure symptoms. So, Let's go into what happens. So like I said, most often, if a patient is to have cardiotoxicity, it is an asymptomatic decline in the ejection fraction. Um, normally we see an ejection fraction of 50% or greater. And so what we are typically doing is monitoring echocardiograms or MUGA scans every three months. And if there is a decline, we take action immediately so that most patients have only an asymptomatic decline and never have any symptomatic decrease. Oftentimes, um, the decline that we see in the ejection fraction is reversible, and that means that it's reversible by simply stopping the HER2 new directed therapy. And depending on the degree of breast cancer the patient has, the patient's wishes, their goals, we can oftentimes rechallenge successfully with Herceptin after recovery without any significant issues. They have done studies where they've done cardiac biopsies after exposure to trastuzumab, and they haven't shown any evidence that there has been any myocyte damage or any significant cardiac issues. So one of the drugs that um, as breast cancer survivors, many of you may have heard about is adriamycin. Adriamycin actually carries more concerns for cardiomyopathy and myocyte damage. Um, and that drug actually does cause, can cause some permanent effects on, on the heart. Um, but this drug is very different from adriamycin uh, with no permanent damage noted um, um, in our uh, cardiac biopsies. So, the pathophysiology of why this happens um, is not well understood. The thought is that there could be blockade of the HER2 new signaling in the myocardium, and that signaling um, mechanism may cause some issues with the heart function. It doesn't seem like the dosage that we give makes a difference. And like I said, it's oftentimes reversible um, with full recovery within three to four months and has not shown on biopsies any structural heart damage. Risk factors of developing cardiomyopathy, age being greater than 50, um, previous or concurrent anthra anthracycline use. Anthracyclines are referring to the adriamycin drug that I was speaking of. 
being overweight or obese, um, pre-existing heart issues, um, high blood pressure. Um, and so we never give anthracyclines concurrently. And in general, like I said, we are typically trying to avoid combining adriamycin with HER2 new directed therapy. Um, it's pretty rare scenarios where I would um, use both of those drugs at the same time. Um, and so, um, like I said, we are typically monitoring patients every three months while on their treatment. And that's either through an echocardiogram or a radionuclide study called uh, a MUGA to monitor patients. Um, and so the treatment, so if this was to happen to a patient where we would see that their heart function was declined, what I typically do is I uh, immediately stop the trastuzumab. We at Novant have cardiologists that we are working with that are specialized in our oncology care. And they're kind of right, at, right beside us when we start seeing these problems. Um, like I said, this incidence is pretty low, but if we do, we, um, we typically have patients see our cardiology colleagues and the decision is made about whether they would need any further therapy. Um, typically, if they do need therapies, it's with blood pressure medicines called ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, which have also been shown to delay and even reverse any changes in the heart function. But also just stopping the trastuzumab itself has, has helped with recovery. And then, like I said before, we, can, we then have to make a tough decision about whether we'll re-challenge with the trastuzumab. And that, again, is really a shared decision between myself, the cardiologist, and the patient um, about the risks and benefits, the degree of the breast cancer, um, and the risk of recurrence as well. Um, so what are the ways that we can prevent um, breast cancer from, uh, prevent patients from developing cardiomyopathy from Herceptin. So maintaining good blood pressure control. Um, and it's really also about just keeping yourself healthy um, before and during treatment. So if you have high cholesterol, making sure that your primary care doctor is managing your cholesterol, you're taking your cholesterol medicines, um, making sure that your um, blood glucose has been controlled, eating well, stopping smoking, exercise, weight control. Some of this is difficult while you're going through active treatment, but even on the maintenance Herceptin, keeping all of these things intact can help prevent um, development of cardiomyopathy. And as, on, as an oncologist, um, like I said, we try to avoid anthracite, using anthracyclines more sparingly. So I've also, you know, like I mentioned, there have been now so many advances in her, Herceptin and other drugs that are targeting the HER2 receptor, I think it's also important to recognize that all of these drugs have some degree of an effect on the heart. Um, I have listed some of those other drugs that we have used, but you can see that the percentage of risk is a lot lower than Herceptin. So for example, Lipatinib has about a 1.4% incidence and in symptomatic um, her symptomatic cardiomyopathy is about 0.2%. Pertuzumab, which is used from stage one to stage four patients, really has no additional cardiotoxicity and so should not be a significant problem. TDM1 has about a 1.7%. Neratinib, no additional cardiotoxicity. Inher2, 0.9%. And Margituximab, about a 1.9% risk of cardiotoxicity. So that is pretty much it. Um, I am, like I said, I am happy to speak further or answer any questions that everyone else has um, and um, open the forum to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Misra. Does anyone have any, does anyone have any questions? Dr. Mizra knows me that I always have questions. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Dr. Mizra. We know how uh, hard you work and that this is a, makes an extra long day for you. And I will be seeing you soon in the office. For those who don't know Dr. Mizra, she's fantastic. She's been my <laughs> oncologist throughout my four plus years of my cancer journey. 
Um, something that I'm always just ignorant and curious about. I know that in my case, that some of my cells were invasive. Is, is this her, does um, HER2 NAU cancer only come with invasive cells or can it come, is it always some sort of invasive cancer? That's just something I feel like I should know by now and I, I still don't. So um, HER2 new, it's interesting, HER2 new is overexpressed in DCIS as well. Um, and so they have looked in DCIS. So DCIS is different from invasive breast cancer, right? DCIS means that the, there are breast cancer cells within the ducts, but they never found a way into the bloodstream. So that's why cutting it out by itself solves the problem. So, but it, it's an interesting question, but HER2 new is overexpressed in DCIS as well um, and has a, a fair, fairly high degree of expression. And they have looked at studies of, of seeing whether Herceptin given to patients with DCIS may help prevent further recurrence after surgery. And those studies haven't really panned out to show any benefit thus far. So, but it, it is overexpressed there. We just haven't shown any benefit of giving Herceptin to patients who have just DCIS with her 2 new overexpression. So we don't typically test for her 2 new among patients with DCIS. We only check for it with invasive. But her 2 new is also has been found to have expression in gastric cancers, lung cancers. Oh, wow. um, and so we're starting to use these her 2 new directed therapies for other types of cancers as well. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I had a question. Is there a window as to when um, these issues with heart, with the heart would arise? Yeah, so typically we see them within while patients are on therapy. And then after therapy, um, I think patients are usually, as long as they're doing well, we don't see any late recurrences. I've never seen a late recurrence, or sorry, late issue of cardiotoxicity after Perceptin. It is only while they're actively receiving it. And that makes sense because that's why we can see that it reverses once we stop. And that's different from what we see with adriamycin. Right. Um, with adriamycin, we can see later recurrence, later effects on the heart. And so um, that's why we are always talking about um, patient symptoms and following them. Um, and we're starting to look at patients who are at higher risk, um, specifically those patients that are older and have received adriamycin at doing more surveillance with echocardiograms um, for those patients. And then particularly those patients who have received um, in other cancer types, um, any sort of mediastinal radiation or radiation to the heart. Um, and we don't typically give that degree of radiation in breast cancer patients. It's more in our lymphoma patients or um, where patients are receiving very high doses of adriamycin greater than 250 milligrams per meter square, which again, we never reach to in breast cancer. We more often see in lymphoma or sarcomas. Any other questions for me? If I can ask just one more. Um, again, I had my therapy four and a half years ago and then it was you know, a 20 year old drug. Do we know anything else about lo like long-term what to think about with Herceptin beyond the heart issues? Are there other things that those of us who went through that therapy should be thinking about, um, you were talking about the newer therapies, which of course makes me wonder if I should run back and get those two. Um, just anything that we, anything that we know that we didn't know maybe a few years ago about Herceptin? Yeah, I can't think of anything long-term from Herceptin. Um, definitely the chemotherapy backbone that patients have with the Herceptin can carry more side effects. And particularly when I think about that, I think about um, you know, with the paclitaxel, particularly it's more neuropathy, um, that can carry long-term side effects for patients. Um, and that's why I, I'm pretty diligent about watching for those symptoms here at Novant. We are icing patients' hands and feet while they're going through therapy to try to limit, um, that side effect. 
Um, and then the carboplatin side effect, the biggest side effect that I worry about is blood counts um, and um, their recovery of their blood counts. Um, I think patients in general who have received chemotherapy are more prone to infections. Um, but once recovery, I think they should be okay. I do worry, you know, in the era of COVID, I've been a little bit more conscientious about um, some some early studies that suggested that there might be a, a higher risk of complications with COVID. I think now as we're all more vaccinated and have more safe, um, safe measures taken, and now that, you know, I think the Omicron variant seems to be a little bit milder than what we were seeing in the past, I feel a little bit more safer that patients won't have these severe complications. But um, you know, those are the risks that I see. I think it's more, like I said, from the chemotherapy backbone, though, rather than the her to new um, directed therapy. And then, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these newer therapies are coming out that are very exciting. But um, for the most part, we are pretty much sticking to the backbone. Um, and um, yeah, so I think our, our treatment regimens of Paclitaxel, Herceptin, um, Carboplatin, and Pertuzumab have pretty much been the standard for several years now. So. A great talk. We will be, we have recorded this. So if you wish to watch it again or uh, want to refer it to somebody, please do so. And I'm going to close out the recording. Okay, well, have a good evening, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this.